her the floor. She has a presentation for all of you today. So feel free to ask any questions. We are available all the time. Thanks, Beth. As Beth said, um, I'm the operations manager for GM Title. Um, and what that means really is that um, I just supervise the day to day, make sure that the deals are running smoothly, make sure there's no issues. If there are issues, getting them resolved as quickly as possible. Um, you know, our goal is for Title to never be a worry of yours and to provide service that's catered to you as well as your customers. So um, our goal is to provide robust communication, seamless service and expertise, um, you know, to you guys. Obviously, title is our expertise um, and we're happy to help in any way that we can. So today I, I um, created a presentation that I'll um, share in just a second to kind of take you through who GM is, but more importantly, the life of a deal um, and some important information that you might want. Beth, can you do me a favor? If there are questions in the chat, can you just let me know and um, we'll, it'll be hard for me to Sure. My screen. Hold on one second, guys. I'm also putting our cell phone numbers on here and our email addresses because um, I am available all of the time. And if you cannot um, get a hold of me and there's something that I can't answer, I will. Uh, Get a hold of Tiffany, even if it is the nights of the weekends and we're not at a baseball or a soccer game. Yep. Yeah, I'm available anytime on my cell phone. Feel free to text me, call me. I took several calls this weekend. I'm always happy to do that. <clears throat> Can everyone see? Can everyone see that? Uh, I don't think you're screen sharing yet, Tiffany. Okay. Did you get your screen at the bottom? I did. And then you have to select a screen. Okay. Where do I select a screen? Uh, so when you hit share screen, it should ask you, a little pop-up should come up and ask you what screen you want to share. And then if you have Perfect. a PowerPoint or whatever the presentation is, you should be able to select it there. Wonderful. I'll try again. Sorry, guys. I'm not used to having three screens open. All right. How's that? Yep, we can see it now. Thank you. Okay, awesome. All right, so this first page is really just our contact info. We're open 9 to 5.30 daily. You're always welcome, of course, to email uh, your closing team or myself. If you need anything outside of those hours, I'll give you my contact info here. So you'll see Beth and I, here's our information. Um, the bottom one is my cell phone number and the bottom one for Beth, that's her cell phone number as well. So you're welcome. And I'll email this to anyone who'd like it. Um, if you need a net sheet, Beth is certainly happy to do any training that you'd like um, on how to do a net sheet through our website. It's super easy. Um, you can do seller net sheets, buyer estimates, just a title fee quote, and then it's branded to you. So if you want to print it out and bring it to a listing presentation or a buyer's meeting, uh, you can brand it to yourself, which is nice. So here at GM, we work in a team environment. Um, there are many hands that uh, touch a transaction throughout the life of it. And I'll just kind of take you sort of through who does what, and that way you have an idea of um, how we do things. For the most part, the majority of your communication is gonna be with the escrow assistant and the escrow officer. Uh, we don't want too many people reaching out to you guys. You know, it's hard enough to, in a transaction, to keep track of who's the lender, who's the home inspector, who's the stager, who's, you know, there's a million people involved in a transaction sometimes it feels like. So we don't want to inundate everybody with too many people on our end. So the majority of the communication that both you and your client are going to receive are from the escrow assistant as well as the escrow officer. 
Um, the escrow assistant, they open the file, they reach out to the customers, get the information sheets, um, they order everything that we need and follow up with the lender um, for status on closing. And I'll, I'll definitely drill into that a little bit more here on the next page. The escrow officer is ultimately responsible for balancing the closing disclosure, um, getting the closing scheduled, or rather letting our closing coordinator know to schedule the closing. Um, she works a lot with the buyers and the sellers to you know, find out what does their schedule look like. Obviously, this is a very busy time for your clients. They're moving, um, you know, they're trying to pack up a truck. They don't want to stop and sign documents necessarily. So, and obviously everybody works and has families and they're busy. So we do whatever we can to make it as convenient for them as possible. And that's where the closing coordinator comes in. Um, she contacts the buyer and the seller, sets up the closing, coordinates the professional notary that we use in-house and make sure the documents get to the notary and the uh, closing happens when, where, and on time that it should. Then we have a post-closing coordinator um, and what she does is she processes everything after everybody has signed and I'll kind of go into that. So essentially she's the one who cuts the checks, pay, gets everything paid off, ships everything out to the lender and gets funding approval. So this looks like a lot and I'm sorry. Um, and it's probably about kind of half of what we do, but I wanted to give you a really good idea of what it looks like here on our side. So a life of a transaction from start to finish is, of course, we start with the purchase agreement. Um, we review the purchase agreement to make sure that everything is signed and um, uh, then, you know, everything's there, the buyer, seller name, contact information, um, are they getting a home warranty, things like that. We look at all of that at the very beginning. We enter everything into our system, and then we order the title search. Um, so a lot of people don't really know what a title search is, or why do we need a title search, what is title insurance, what is this all about? Because most people think of us as just a company to facilitate the closing which is of course true, that's what we do. Um, but the other part of that is we actually ensure the transaction to make sure that your buyer, the end buyer gets clear title. They will get a title insurance policy. As you know, it's standard in all of our contracts here in this area that an owner's policy be issued and that typically is split between the buyer and seller. So in order to issue the title insurance, we have to do a 42 year title search uh, depending on the property, we could go back much further than that. It just depends on how long the seller owned the property um, and anything, you know, other factors that may come into play. So we at least go back 42 years on every search. Um, what a lot of people don't know is they think a title exam just looks at the seller. We actually also look at the buyers. So we run the buyer in the county where the property is located. Um, we run them for child support liens. IRS liens, state of Ohio liens, any lien that might be against them judgments that might be against them, we run the buyers to make sure that um, title is clear as far as that goes. If the buyer does have liens and we don't catch them or we don't even look for them, then when that deed and that mortgage is filed, the mortgage won't be in first lien position, which is very important. So we want to make sure that um, we run the buyers as well. And you'd be surprised, a lot of times we find, we find a lot of stuff. Um, we also, uh, if the buyer has an open divorce, we look for that because divorces oftentimes have financial ramifications where uh, there might be a restraining order, the buyer is not allowed to buy a house until the divorce is complete, things like that. So we do re review the divorces as well. And we look for bankruptcies and foreclosures. Um, we also look through the chain of title throughout the life of the title exam. And what that means is essentially if we look at all the deeds that have been filed in the last 42 years. So we have to make sure that, for instance, if there was a husband and wife in title, um, that they both signed the deed to the next party. Uh, if there was just one, let's say a gentleman in title, and he deeded to the new buyer, but he was married, and his wife did not sign the deed, then that's a problem. We actually had one recently where um, a buyer on a previous, it wasn't our deal, it was a previous um, 
title company that did the closing prior to ours fairly recently, their, buy, their seller had gotten married from the time that the property went under contract to the time that it sold and she didn't tell anybody. And we actually found her marriage certificate and they had to go back and have her and her new husband sign a deed to our seller um, because um, her new husband had a dower interest the day they got married. Does everyone understand dower? Have you heard that word? Do you have any questions about what dower is? Because I know it can be confusing. No? Can you maybe just, I've got an idea of what it is. Sorry, hi, I'm Jordan. Um, hey Jordan. Can you, just, can you kind of just go over the basics of it and um, sure. some kind of weird situations that might come up? Absolutely. Um, so I, I saw over the weekend, actually, someone had posted a question and I sent them a private message um, on your KW page, Facebook page. Um, so Ohio is what's considered a dower state. Not all states have dower. And essentially what it means is your spouse has a dower interest in a property that you, any property that you own. Also, your spouse uh, has a dower interest in any property that you're purchasing. So oftentimes we get questions of, okay, our sellers are in the middle of a divorce. The divorce is not final, but they have filed for divorce. Does the spouse still have to sign in order to sell the house? They're not entitled. Why do they have to sign? If a seller of a property, regardless of whether their spouse is entitled or not, is married, their spouse will always have to sign the deed at closing. They don't have to sign anything else. They're not obligated to get a copy of the closing disclosure or the purchase agreement anything along those lines because they are not entitled. However, they do have to sign the deed to extinguish their dower interest. So to give a good example, let's say you have four people in title. They each have a quarter interest in the property. If we want to look at the numbers, a dower interest isn't really a number. It is more of a they're not in ownership of the property. They have, I'm trying to think of the best word, I'm sorry. Um, it's almost like an invisible interest. They don't have a quarter interest or a half an interest because they're not entitled, but they do have an interest in the property. Their, their spouse cannot just sell a property without them knowing is essentially what that allows for. Um, so on the, on the flip side, if you have a buyer who is going through a divorce or who is married um, and they're purchasing a property and they say, well, I don't want my spouse to have know anything about this. That's not possible. With Ohio being a dower state, their spouse at least has to sign the mortgage, releasing their dower interest. So on the mortgage, it will have a space for the spouse to sign and it will state after their name, signing to release dower interest only. So they don't have to know the ins and the outs of the transaction. They don't have to know the purchase price. They don't have to, some lenders do require that the spouse um, review and execute the closing disclosure, um, but not all lenders. We don't require that. We just require they sign the mortgage. So essentially it's an invisible interest for the spouse to protect the, uh, the spouse from their husband or wife selling a property without their knowledge or purchasing a property and financing a property without their knowledge. If it's a cash deal and it's a buyer, there's nothing that needs to be done. The spouse, the spouse doesn't have to sign. But once that deed is filed, that husband or wife automatically has a dower interest in that property. Hey, Tiff. Yeah. Sorry, I missed a few questions. Um, uh, can we pause for a second? Yeah. Um, Maria, did she answer your question about why 42 years? No. Okay. So um, the American Land Title Association, as well as the Ohio Land Title Associ Association, feel that 42 years, depending on how long the seller has been in title, is a sufficient amount of time to go back and find any title defects. Um, most people don't live in a house for 30 years anymore. It's unusual. So um, typically, we go back that 30 years plus 12, just to make sure there are no issues prior to when that per person may have purchased the property. There are circumstances where we will go back. I've had many, many times where we've had to go back 100 years or more. It just depends. Um, and, and that's, you know, if there's already a break in the chain of title, we might have to go back a couple of different owners. Um, but yeah, 42 years is the standard across Ohio. 
and that's what the Ohio and um, American Title Associations recommend. They feel right. that's enough time. And I had a follow-up um, question on dollar rights too. Can I just jump sure. in right now? Um, so I have a listing where the um, it's um, the the owners are a father and son, and um, the father is married. And he's they're in their he, they are in their eighties, and the son is divorced. So are but. They, they signed the, per, the listing agreement together without the, the mom, the wife. Um, so, but if this, this pro, when this property sells, you're saying that the, the mom would have to sign as well. Correct. In, for deed, Correct. For, the, for the title. Right. Yeah, so wh whoever's in title has to sign the purchase agreement and all of the closing documents. Um, if there is a spouse, then yes. they just have to sign the deed. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, Latoya wants to know if we can receive a copy of the presentation after this. Absolutely, I'd be happy. Danielle, can I forward it to you? Yeah, absolutely. And I can send it out to everybody. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to send it. It's, in, it's just a PDF that I created in Canva. Perfect. Okay, sorry, I did not see this, Danielle. Um, okay, so we're going to back up to... Uh, the, the first point of receiving the contract, Tiffany. Um, okay. Danielle says, um, when I'm working through my first deal and I have an accepted contract, what documents are needed at step one? Does everything need to be signed? Just the pur purchase agreement or do I have, do I update you with all the documents as I get them signed? I can take this one. Sure. Okay, so um, the purchase agreement, the most important thing is that everything is initialed for buyer and seller. If you have two buyers and only one initials at the bottom, it's not a complete contract. So we need to have everything completed. And then if there is um, the other documents, as um, if you do have a home warranty, that would be great to have all of those things all at once. If you have your escrow letter, um, that can be done later, but- We would um, love have, that. Having it from the get-go is super important having the agency disclosure, all of those things are a complete contract to us at title, having all of those documents all together in one initial email is absolutely fantastic. Um, updating the documents throughout the process um, in regards to a release of contingencies, um, a change in purchase price, um, an extension, um, things that were found on the inspection, absolutely those things will need to be updated as they go. But initially with the contract, we would like everything to be signed, initialed. The most important, obviously, is a signature. The most important information for us in title is the contact info, the email address and the phone number of the buyers and the sellers is the is very important from the get-go because emails will go out automatically that are generated when the transaction is started the seller will be sent out um, an authorization form regarding their mortgage but if we don't have an email that will be delayed if we have a cash transaction um, obviously we won't have that but we need to have contact info especially if it could be a five to ten day twelve day close so right. all right then the next, yeah, and, and anything else? Uh, well, yeah, and obviously I'm not going through my first transaction because I'm not licensed, but most of these people are going through their first few. Um, so do you guys need walkthrough addendum, every single addendum, FHA, everything that we're getting? Because I know the lender only, you know, there's some things that the lender doesn't want to see, right? And they talked about that last week. So you guys want every form that we're getting signed sent over to you, correct? Yes. Perfect. Great. Write yeah. that down. And, and I feel like, um, rather than saying we want this and we don't want that, just send us everything. Okay. And if we don't really need it, we'll just have it in our file to look at later if we do need to look at it later. Perfect. When in doubt, send it. Um, we'd love the lender, if you're, if you're representing the buyer and they know who they're going to be using. Um, oftentimes we do get a pre-approval letter with purchase agreements, but it's not necessarily who they're going to be using. So if, you, if the buyers are confident they're going to be using cross-country or another lender, um, we'd love, you know, that information up front as well. 
And that right. just that just gives us a big head start on, you know, the more information we have at the beginning, it sets us up for success throughout the entire deal. All right, next question from Jason. Does the buyer agent facilitate the exchange of these documents with the title company or does the seller agent? Uh, I think every agent is different. Um, I, there's no f steadfast rule on that as far as I know. Um, if I were on your end of it, I would just send it just to be sure that it's been sent. I can't, it doesn't happen very often anymore, um, but for years and years we would get a call and say, oh, are you working on 123 Main Street? And I would say, oh, we don't have that deal. Oh, I thought so-and-so sent it in. So I would just send it in. Um, we do, you know, if you, it, I don't know, do you guys use dot loop or anything like that? We certainly can accept documents that way. Um, I would just send it in regardless of who's supposed to. I don't, Danielle, is there some sort of rule as to who's, who is supposed to? I'm not sure. Uh, no. I mean, if he's just talking about all of the documents, Jason, is that what you're talking about? I can't find you on my little thing here. Is that what you're asking, Jason? Like when... Okay. Yeah, that's right. I, there's a lot of stuff here, purchase agreement, all that stuff. Obviously, that gets all, that's a thing between both agents to work through, but who actually sends it all, you, you probably get duplicative emails with the same information. I would say that's okay. If, there's a do, if they're getting it twice, that's better than you thinking somebody else is doing it. So I would just say as the agent, whatever side you're on, I would send it all in anyways. Okay. Yes, I agree. I think usually whoever directed the title order sends it in. Does the um, escrow it, letter also something that both agents fill out, or is that just one agent? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Is the escrow letter something that one agent or the other has to fill out, or is that just whoever? Um, I would, sorry, I'll type in there just for our market center. So sometimes if there's, if you are representing the buyer or whichever, whatever client, and the other agent is um, also in our office, sometimes that agent or one of you will do the escrow letter for both of you. But typically, if you're representing a buyer, you don't know what the, what the listing agent is making. So you would only do it for your side. You have to put their information in on the other side, but you'll only put your commission part in. Yeah, got it. Yeah. And we would, we would prefer it that way. We, even if, you know, however you guys do it internally. Oh, Tiffany, somehow you ended up muted. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll mute you. <laughs> she appears frozen. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Just can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? I'm trying to, oh, I'm trying to unmute you, but it's not allowing me to. How's that? Okay, now we can hear you. I don't know what happened. Weird. Let me try this again. All right, can you guys see that now? Yeah, you're good. Perfect. Um, so yeah, we would we we would prefer the escrow letters be separate, listing agent, buyer's agent, and that way we can see if there's any issues or errors. Um, sometimes the listing agent will put the full one and they won't really break it out for us. We love to see it broken out for us. Um, I, let me go back to the documents. I, I'm looking at a question from Deborah about a power of attorney and um, that reminded me if there is any of that extra information that we need to know or the buyer or seller has an LLC, having those documents up front, um, if we have not, never worked with that LLC before, we will have to verify all of that through the state and that may take some time. So getting all of that information um, before, even if it's a listing appointment, getting that information from them. Um, even the even the homeowners association information, the condo association information, we do collect all of that. Um, but if the seller offers it up readily, we'd love to see that as soon as possible. Um, oftentimes, it takes quite a while to get association information from 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 management companies. Um, so any information up front that you can get would be great. Power of attorneys especially are very important because they need to be reviewed very carefully. 
uh, to make sure they're authentic. Do everyone wants to know if they can be downloaded from the internet or is it specific to the title company? Uh, can you clarify that for me? It just says the power of attorney. I'm wondering if she thinks it's a, a blank form. Deborah, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm sorry. So I have a buyer now. Her mom helped her um, with the financing, but her dad is not on there. So they're saying her dad can't go to the closing um, because of his immune system. So they're saying that um, they need power of attorney. So is this something that the title company provides or is this something that they have to find the forms? Do they provide the forms or? We would, uh, we would prefer they not go out and get their own forms because oftentimes there, there's, oh, is that me? Oh, that might be my clock. Sorry. I didn't hear anything. Sorry. Um, so oftentimes the buyer will, what we would prefer is if they do need a power of attorney, we work with several outside attorneys who prepare our deeds for us. And we would be happy to um, uh, get them in touch with the buyer. We can request the power of attorney be prepared for them. And then we can even help them with the facilitation of getting a notary to notarize it with him. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, an, a power of attorney should always be prepared by an attorney. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend they go out on the internet and try to find one. I, I had a circumstance once where a granddaughter had a power of attorney for her grandmother and was trying to sell a home. Uh, her grandmother was, was ne then at the point where she could not sign anything. She was not of... Um, she was not cognizant at the time. So anything previous to the power of attorney, or I'm sorry, following the power of attorney, she just couldn't sign anymore. Uh, she had dementia. And the power of attorney that they had signed um, did not give her the authority to sell real property on her grandmother's behalf. So essentially they had to wait um, to sell the property until it went through probate, if and when her grandmother passes. So an attorney is important in that situation. Just let us know. We're happy. We have all the resources. Just ask us. Okay, along with the power of attorney, Jason has a question. If the house is in a trust, I assume you need trust documents. Correct. <laughs> oh, and then he said, you already answered my question. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Trust, LLC, corporation, power of attorney. Any, if, if you know that it's currently in an estate, you know, if there's currently a pro open probate case, we need to know that right away. Uh, we can get in touch with the probate attorney. Uh, if there is no attorney, we can at least get a head start on making sure that the appropriate documentation has been filed. Um, the probate, just to give everyone an idea, we just, we're finishing up. We have three right now. Um, the, the county clerk is not even opening mail for three weeks. It's taking them three weeks to even open their mail. So any probate cases that are going on, it's not, it was never a, a quick process and it's even slower now because of COVID. So anything you know like that up front, we would love that information. Even if you don't know what the information is, just tell your seller, you know, the title company is going to need your trust documents. You might want to get those out of storage or wherever they may be. And they'll reach out to tell you exactly what it is they need. Cause we don't need the whole trust. A lot of the times, um, depending on how complicated and robust the trust is, we might just need sections of it, signature pages, things like that. So just maybe give them a warning and at least then you've prepared them and they don't feel surprised that we need it. Any other questions, Beth? Um, no, but I was, um, I might have one for everyone. What about the point of sale? Are there any documents that they would need? Yeah. So I'll, um, I'll scooch down to the below. I definitely address point of sales here. So I'll confirm, you know, if you guys, that should be ordered, I would imagine if it's not already ordered at, when you list the property, it should definitely be ordered when you, um, when you're under contract. Again, things are not as quick as they used to be in the cities. We're not quick to begin with. So the sooner you get the point of sale ordered, the better. If you're not sure if there's a point of sale, call us, we'll let you know. We can even give you the contact information. Um, 
for the city and even maybe some additional information we might have just from our general knowledge. Um, keep us up to date on the point of sales. If there are repairs that need to be done prior to closing uh, and a reinspection is going to need, you know, needs to be done by the city, definitely let us know. Um, oftentimes this will delay closing. So the quicker it started, the quicker the repairs are done, the quicker it's reinspected, we can close on time. But I can tell you, most of our point of sale files right now are being delayed. Anything else? All right, we can move on. I will pay attention to the chat box. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so once the, after the 42 year search is done, we search the buyer, we search the seller. Um, we actually review the title commitment and the exam to make sure that there's no issues. If there are blatant issues, we'll bring everybody's attention to it um, in the appropriate parties and we'll do everything we can to get those title issues fixed. Um, at the very beginning, typically within three days of receiving the purchase agreement, uh, we send an email to the buyer and seller with an information sheet. It's pretty detailed um, and we ask them for a lot of information and most of which we've already discussed. Um, do you have a trust? Do you have an LLC? Are you married? What's your social security number, which we need to get their payoffs for? Who's your lender? Do you have a homeowners association? It goes on and on. Uh, so we ask them to fill that out and send it back at their, you know, as soon as possible. At that time, we also offer them what's called the closing protection coverage. Um, so if anyone who's not familiar, uh, you'll often hear it called a CPC or a CPL. It's offered to all parties in the transaction, buyer, seller, and lender. And there is a charge for that. The fee goes directly to the underwriter. We don't collect that fee. Um, it's not something that, you know, we make money off of. It goes to the underwriter and eventually to the state and it protects people for, um, against fraud. So title insurance protects your customers, your clients against title issues. It does not protect their money. So let me say that again, title insurance protects them from title issues. Um, forgery being one of those, which is a form of fraud, of course, if, if I were to forge somebody's signature, they would be covered for that. It does not protect their money. So if uh, somebody from a title company were to misappropriate the buyer or seller funds in any way and commit fraud against your client, the closing protection letter is what covers them for that. Okay, uh, we are not allowed to recommend to any customer whether they should or should not purchase the coverage. What we do is we just explain to them, this is what it covers you for. If you, if, depending on your comfort level, you're welcome to purchase it. It's not an exorbitant fee or you can uh, decline it, whichever you prefer. You're gonna get a lot of calls about closing protection letters. Um, they're gonna call and say, this, the title company is offering me this. Should I take it? Should I not? Um, I would suggest that you tell them it's completely up to you. It protects your money in the transaction. If you have a seller who's selling a half a million dollar house and they don't have a mortgage and they're getting a half a million dollars, it might be worth it for them. Same thing with a cash buyer, especially. So lenders always get a closing protection letter. It's pretty much assumed that lenders get it. They always request it 99.99% of the time. Um, we provide the buyer immediately upfront along with all these other documentation, our wiring instructions. We will never send them um, alternate wiring instructions via email. It just won't happen. Um, so if they call you and they say, oh, I got new wiring instructions from the title company, that's a big red flag. Tell them stop, don't do, don't do whatever it is you're about to do, call the title company to verify. Um, so we try to give them as much information upfront as we can to prepare them and also to set the closing up for success to close on time. Uh, at that time, we also prepare the preliminary closing disclosure and that's mainly for the purpose of providing it to the lender. And essentially the preliminary closing disclosure only includes the purchase price, the title fees and the tax operations. Um, we also at that time request, if we haven't gotten them already, we request the escrow letters from the realtors um, the lender contact information and the point of sale status. Uh, once we have a lender contact information, oftentimes the lender will send us a title order um, because we are giving them a, a loan policy. The buyer gets an owner's policy and the lender gets a loan policy. 
or to owner's policy, loan policy. Um, so we send them the, their closing protection letter, the commitment, 24 month chain of title, which is two years of deed, copies of deeds that have been filed, our wiring instructions, the preliminary CD and the tax certificate, all of which we prepare. At that time, we order the location survey, the deed and payoffs for liens, and that will include homeowners associations, mortgages, lines of credit, things like that. Um, one thing I did want to mention, because this happens almost every day, is a seller will say, well, you know, we'll find a mortgage on there. They'll say, oh, I don't have a mortgage. And so we'll do a search. And of course, we find a mortgage and we ask them about it. And they say, oh, no, that's a line of credit. They forget entirely that they actually signed a mortgage to receive those funds for their line of credit, home equity line of credit. So um, oftentimes that confuses them. We try to explain it to them that yes, it is a line of credit more than likely, but you did sign a note in a mortgage and the mortgage was recorded. Uh, it needs to be paid off in full. It's attached to the property and we'll pay it off at closing. So if a seller tells you, oh, I have a line of credit, but I don't have any mortgages, more often than not, it is a mortgage. Um, so after we order the survey, deed and payoffs, we wait for those to come in. Every lender is different. Um, our surveys, our survey companies are wonderful. We, they understand that we need our surveys back as quickly and as accurately as possible. So we typically get those back within three to five business days, usually less. Um, we review those right away to make sure there are no encroachments. If there are, we notify everyone right away. Uh, we also have the buyer and seller sign off on the closing disclosure, or I'm sorry, the survey. Hold on one second. We also have them sign off on the survey, even if it, there are no issues. But if there are, we definitely have them sign off on the survey. Um, and like I said, every lender is different. So we could order a payoff from Wells Fargo, it takes 20 minutes, or we could order a payoff from PNC and it takes five business days. It just depends on the lender. So we try to get those ordered in it. We don't want to order them too soon because the seller may make a payment in between there or so we try to order them about 10 days out from closing or a week out from closing, depending on who the lender is. And then at that time, we also finish clearing any title issues. We see, do we have the point of sale, you know, certificate of compliance yet? Do we have the payoffs? Do we have the survey? Is the lender ready? If the lender's not ready, why aren't they ready? How long are they going to take? Things like that. And then we try to update everybody um, throughout the transaction. Um, when we have a clear to close, that's sort of when everything really starts moving quickly. Um, I do want everyone to understand, especially being newer in the business, that clear to close does not mean they're ready to sign that day. A lot of what a lot of lenders are doing is they're issuing a clear to close with conditions. It could be several days before they can actually sign their loan documents. Um, I think a, a lot of them are issuing a clear to close because it, it looks great. Everyone gets excited. Yay, we're clear to close. But more times than not lately, especially with different lenders that aren't local like cross country um, and you know some of the other local lenders, um, sort of the unknowns that we don't work with a whole lot, we're finding that clear to close does not really mean clear to close at all. Oftentimes too, what they'll do is we'll get a clear to close and it is actually good to go. And then we'll say, okay, well, when are we gonna get the loan documents? Because just because it's clear to close does not mean that we will have the loan documents within minutes. Oftentimes it's 24 to 48 hours before we'll even have the loan documents, which means we can't schedule the buyer and seller to sign for 24 to 48 hours. So every lender is different. We try to communicate that to everybody. Okay, yes, we do have the clear to close, but we're not gonna have instructions and documents until Thursday. We can have everybody sign late Thursday or Friday morning in order to close Friday afternoon, that kind of thing. So each one is different, it just depends. Mm. Um, at that point, we schedule everybody to sign. Uh, we review the lender's instructions. We input everything into the system to match what the lender has. And we, we do what's called balancing the CD with the lender to make sure that the our CD in our system matches what the lender has. 
because the closing disclosure is ultimately a lender's document. They are responsible for making sure it's accurate, making sure it's issued. Um, after everybody signs, everything comes back to the office, all the signed documents come back to the office from the notary and um, everything has to be processed. There's quite an extensive process after um, everybody is signed. So we have to scan everything over to the lender. Oftentimes it has to be in a specific order, what we call a stacking order. We send them copies of signed documents and then they come back and say, oh, yes, you are okay to fund and we'll go ahead and send the wire now. So it's not instantaneous. We don't, the lender doesn't send the wire before they've reviewed anything. Um, so typically we try to get everything over to the lenders first thing in the morning, and then we have their wires hopefully around lunchtime, and then we ship everything to the county and we go ahead and close. Um, in our area, I wanted to explain kind of pre-COVID life, versus the life we're sort of living now. Um, there are, before COVID, we are in what, what you would call an escrow area. So in most of Ohio, everyone would sit down at a table, including the buyer, seller, both realtors and the lender, and they would sign their closing documents, exchange keys and exchange money, right? So that's how they do it in Columbus, Cincinnati, Dayton, Toledo, um, pretty much the rest of the state outside of Northeast Ohio and Youngstown does it that way. We have always been in what you would call an escrow area where everybody signs their closing documents separately and then everything comes back to the title company. We process everything, we receive the money, and then we send it down to the county to um, transfer and record and then we disperse. So. The difference now is that in a lot of counties, we are not able to do that anymore. Specifically, Cuyahoga County is one of them. So in Cuyahoga County, if you're just coming off the street as a regular person, you and me, you can make an appointment at the county to go in and transfer and record a deed. But if you work for a title company or an attorney, you are required, we all have basically mailboxes there. We drop the deeds. And mortgages off and then if we're lucky within two weeks it's recorded so the county is taking Cuyahoga specifically is taking two weeks to record deeds and mortgages so what we do is we go ahead and disperse and close and we issue what's called gap coverage for the title insurance so as long as the buyer has homeowners insurance and we've closed title insurance is effective as soon as, we do, as soon as we disperse funds. So they are covered title insurance and homeowners insurance wise, regardless of whether or not the deed has transferred and filed. So that's something that's a little different now. There are some counties like Summit County, we can e-record there, so we do right away. Um, we transfer and file uh, electronically with Summit County and several, uh, Stark County and several others. Um, but each county is different. So you will get an email from us letting you know we've closed. Um, more times than not, we've dispersed, but the deed and the mortgage have not actually been transferred or filed. And I'll kind of take you through next um, what that communication looks like. So um, our goal is to answer questions before you have to ask them. So our system is very integrated and very user-friendly on our end. Uh, it communicates a lot with the buyer and the seller and you guys as well. So everyone will get an email when the file has been opened, um, letting you know we've received the order. And then a separate email will go out with the buyer, separately to the buyer and seller. Um, you are always gonna be included in every email that goes out to your clients. So you're never left out of the loop. And that first email is gonna be that information sheet, closing protection letter and wiring instructions. That's super important. Um, if we don't already have your escrow letter, the home warranty and things like that, another email will go out to you. And if, you, if we don't get it back, our system automatically sends out reminders. So if you're getting those reminders, it's because we haven't received your escrow letter and other items that we need. 
Um, when we get the earnest money, we will send a receipt out to the buyer and CCU as well. It's just to letting you know that we got the earnest money. Um, we do have a lot of listing agents that like us to let them know we've received it, so we will send them an email as well. There is a question about that in the chat box. Okay. Uh, Jason wants to know if we can just briefly describe the earnest money checks. Are they personal checks? Are they certified checks? The amounts and are they made out to GM title? Correct. They are. Uh, you can do a personal check as long as it's, um, you know, so the, the law in the state of Ohio is anything under $10,000 um, does not have to be a wire. Anything over $10,000 has to be a wire. So let's say they're putting down a pretty big earnest money deposit. It's over 10,000. They do have to wire those funds. Anything under $10,000 you can write a personal check or get a cashier's check for. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis, I, I, would, I would prefer not to accept personal checks over 5,000 here. We definitely have enough time for them to clear the bank. Um, so we'd be okay with taking personal checks payable to GM title. One thing I would love for everyone to do is in the memo section, put the property address. That would be wonderful. Um, we are also too, um, we're just a couple of weeks away from being able to deposit earnest money on our website, which will be really nice. Your buyers can just go on the website and do an ACH there, which is great. We'll let everybody know when that goes live. Did you, uh, want to, did you want to talk about um, a cash transaction when there's earnest money, about the timing of it and when it's received? Um, I mean, earnest money should be sent right away. I would expect, and I believe the purchase agreements typically have a time frame in which the earnest money has to be deposited. Yes, yeah, that's four days in ours. Four days, yeah. So we have people stop in all the time and drop off earnest money. Um, they can mail it to us. I wouldn't suggest mailing it to us with the state of the postal service now. It's taking a long time to get mail. Um, certainly Beth is happy to stop by the office and pick up checks. She's, she does that all the time in Beechwood and Rocky River. So if it's at the office, just let Beth know. She'll grab it. If she can't, I'll run out and grab them. I don't mind. Um, or you guys are welcome to stop in. If you're in the area, certainly stop in and drop them off. But payable to GM title, Note the property address in the memo, and it can be a personal check as long as it's under 10,000. If it's more than 5,000, give me a call. I would prefer a cashier's check in that case. Um, also make sure we have it quickly. If we're getting earnest money too close to closing, it could delay closing because we have to give it time to clear the bank. Also, if you um, want to go on our website, gm-title, and join, you have to create a username and password. That will, um, that's where you do your net sheets, but that's where your buyers will be able to soon uh, do the earnest money. Um, before the website, it would, uh, the wire, I think tip was it for a $40 that the bank would charge to wire. Yeah, earnest I mean, prepare your buyers if they are gonna be wired. We don't charge any wire fees. We don't charge any what you would hear people call junk fees. Um, so we don't charge your buyer to wire, you know, to wire in money and we don't charge them to wire out money, um, but their bank is more than likely going to have a wire fee. So typically to get a cashier's check, it's anywhere between like eight and $12 that the banks charge for a wire, it's more like 30. So if they are required to wire, maybe just prepare them for that as well. Alex um, says in the chat box, I always ask buyers to take a picture of the check for earnest money and send it to me so we know that it is on its way because of the slow mail. That's great. And anytime I receive a check or bring a check, I will scan it and send it to you. Um, and if it does come through the mail and we do receive it, the escrow assistant will also make a copy of it for you. Perfect. Um, so after, um, when everybody's been scheduled, we have a balanced CD, we actually have loan documents in our hands, we will dispatch the notaries out essentially to go do the signings. Um, there are, we are doing a lot of electronic signings now. So Deborah, for instance, uh, the gentleman uh, who needs to sign the power of attorney, he might be able to do that electronically or even sign the closing documents electronically. It depends on the county. 
Um, so we can talk about that separately if you'd like. I'd love to help you with that. Um, but um, so we do give, especially sellers, depending on the county, we will give them the option to sign electronically. Um, and otherwise we will send a notary out to them wherever they are at their convenience or they're welcome to come into the office. And then after signing, our notaries um, will text you to let you know that the signing has been completed. And then the next time we'll reach out is to let you know that everything is closed and dispersed. Um, unless you tell us otherwise, those emails go out typically between 3 and 5 p.m. So if you need, if, if, if it's the expectation of all parties that we close in the morning, we need to know that as, as soon as possible and they need to sign probably two days before the actual closing date. It's virtually impossible most times, depending on the county again, for someone to sign at nine o'clock at night and then have keys by 10 o'clock the next morning. It's just, we're not gonna have funds from the lender by that time. We're not gonna be able to actually disperse funds by that time. So we're happy to do morning, morning closings and disbursements. We just need to know ahead of time. We're, we'll do anything we can to accommodate your, your clients, but just give us as much notice as we can. So for instance, if they need their keys by noon on Friday, they need to sign typically by Wednesday, if that makes sense, or Thursday morning early, the very early, at the very latest. Tiffany. Um, yeah. Jason says, nice to meet us. He's gotta go. <laughs> nice to meet you. Take care, Jason. All right. All right. Um, so we um, we have several layers of review throughout the deal. We just want to let you guys know that. What else? Hey, Tiffany. Yeah. I just have to hop off because I also have an appointment at 11. So when I leave, I'm going to make one of you guys um, the, I don't know what they're called, the hosts of the meeting. So when you're okay. finished, I mean, and guys, ask all of your questions. You guys have them here with you. Um, but when you guys are finished, you can just end the meeting from there. I'm just, I have to pop off because I have an 11 a.m., but I want you guys to get all of your questions answered. So thank you guys so much for doing this. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah, and then just email me that, um, that Canva PDF afterwards, and I'll email it out to everybody. Um, so make sure you guys get all of your questions answered, and then we will see you next week with um, home inspectors, okay? Uh, so let me, Tiffany, I'm going to give you the host rights, okay? Thank you so much. Good to see you. All right, um, so the next one is just ways to stay on track and common challenges and title issues. Um, really, it's just mostly what we've talked about, dotting your I's, crossing your T's, getting all the documentation you can up front, giving your buyer and seller realistic expectations. Um, I think, and I don't know if, you know, what Cross Country said last week as far as writing contracts out, um, Cross country typically closes on time almost every time. We don't have issues with them, um, but most lenders right now, are, they're not closing definitely within 30 days. Um, so just whoever the buyer's lender is, have that conversation up front before you write the purchase agreement. Is it realistic to write a 30 day contract? Probably not, depending on the lender. Um, if you guys have cash transactions, um, we can close those really quickly. We do ask for 10 to 15 business days, um, but certainly if we'd prefer 15 business days, um, but if we are ready and everybody's ready, we always try to close sooner if possible. Um, the things that I just always try to bring to realtors attention is making sure the purchase agreement is fully executed, giving us your escrow letters, keeping us up to date on the point of sales, and always make sure you're keeping us in the loop on addendums, um, removal of contingencies and things like that. Um, so a, a trend that I've noticed lately, which um, scares me a little bit, is that on the removal of contingencies, oftentimes they're adding seller paid closing costs or they're changing the purchase price, which is typically done or has in the past typically been, do been done on addendums. So they'll do the removal of contingencies, they'll note all those things, but on a separate addendum, they'll change the terms of the purchase agreement. This seems to be changing and they're doing it on the actual removal. So all I would ask is that when you're writing the removal of contingencies and you send it over, that you 
bring to our attention in big, bold letters, please review this, it has changes to the purchase agreement. Because that's not the typical place we would see um, items from the purchase agreement changed. Usually it's everybody signing off, we're good to go. We don't even really look at them. Because we're not, we don't know what was on the home inspection. We're not part, you know, privy to all that information, so. Hey, Tony. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, I just want to share with everyone, one thing I learned being in title is if something is sent to me, make sure if you are forwarding it that you, you know, change the, change the subject line. If there is a change in the ROC, you can put it in, it, well, obviously people don't like capital letters in the email, but if there is a change or something very important, put important updates in the subject line, not just in the body of the email. Right. That's very helpful, yes. Yeah, anytime you can share, especially if you're emailing us, please put the purchase agreement in the subject line. That's very helpful. The buyer's name, your seller's name, all that information, when, especially if you're forwarding something, uh, that's very helpful for us. Um, so as far as your buyers go, certainly anytime your buyers or sellers have a question, feel free to give them our, our information. They will know on day one who their escrow officer is and who the escrow assistant is. So, you know, they receive a lot of communication from us throughout the transaction. If they're not getting emails from us, it's either because we don't have their email or it's going to their spam. So I would just tell them to check their spam, um, but certainly have them give the office a call. We'd be happy to answer any questions that they might have. Okay. And most of this is pretty much what we already went over. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up is common title issues that delay closing. Can, can I chime in? <laughs> yeah. Mike Mitchell in the chat box uh, says he highly, highly recommends using the addendums versus the release of contingencies. He says, if not, it gets messy down the road for making contract changes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Um, it just scares me a little bit because um, I mean, I've been doing this for going on 18 years and this is really the first time I'm seeing that being done and it's just unusual. Um, and I don't think, unless you really bring it to our attention in big bold letters, it's gonna be easy for something to get missed there. And we never wanna miss anything like that, something important like that. Um, so some common title issues that delay closing, um, point of sale inspections, well and septic inspections. Depending on the area that you're in, the county may require well and septic inspections, so pay attention to that. If you're not sure if they, they require one, give us a call, we'll let you know. Um, seller title issues, again, it's all about getting that documentation up front, LLC documentation, trusts, estates, corporations, things like that. Prior owner title issues can definitely delay closings. Um, we have a dedicated person who all she does is clear title issues. Um, so usually it will not be a factor on our end unless it's just um, impossible to get a hold of someone, to get the issue fixed. A lot of times the title company is closed or the previous owner might be deceased. Um, there's usually 99% of the time there's an avenue to fix title issues. It's just a matter of having the right people in place, getting a hold of everybody and getting it done. Some common buyer title issues. Um, this happens a lot. Let's say you have a, a buyer, his name is John Smith. There's 1 million John Smiths in, in the state of Ohio. So we will get a title commitment with, with 50 liens that may or may not be John Smith. And so we have to do our due diligence to make sure none of them are actually his. And that can take some time, which is why it's so important that they return the information sheets at the very beginning. Um, so for instance, state of Ohio, uh, we had one the other day, um, a very similar name to John Smith. There were 42 state of Ohio judgment liens, tax liens. We had to fax the state of Ohio to verify that none of those 42 liens were John Smith's. The state of Ohio takes exactly two weeks to get back to us. There's no rushing it. There's no one we can call that, that will do us a favor. It takes two weeks. 
So as long as everyone fills their stuff out and sends it in early, there won't be any delays. Um, and we talked a little bit about survey issues. If there are encroachments or any issues with the survey, we do let everybody know right away and sign off on it right away, including the lender. Closing coordination. So this is actually a position that we created um, and hired a new person about, I think she's been here about five weeks. She's amazing. Her name is Sierra um, and her job is to schedule the closings. So essentially the escrow officer says, okay, we're ready to schedule. We've got instructions or at least an ETA for instructions and loan documents. Go ahead and get everybody scheduled. So she'll call the buyer and seller, find out the most convenient time and location on the days we need them to sign. And um, she'll book the notary. She'll confirm with all parties via email what time the signing is, where it is, who the notary is, as well as the notary's contact information. Um, I feel like this day and age, it's very important. Um, you know, it's like getting an Uber. You don't get into the Uber unless you see the person's picture first, right? And so we want to make sure that your customers know who's coming to their home or their work or wherever they may be going, what their name is and what their phone number is. Um, and they can certainly make sure that it's the right person. Um, and she also um, makes sure that the notary is going to be there on time. That is our goal for the notary to always be early. As far as I'm concerned, early is on time. So not too early, but early. My um, son told me that last night for baseball. He's like, mom, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. I agree. <laughs> the best basketball coach I ever had, that was his rule. If you were on time, you were late and you had to run laps and suicides. And I did not enjoy either of those. So I prefer to be early. And he's still a friend to this day. He was actually my son's uh, AP government teacher. So, um, so yeah, and so, and we do also have notaries all across the country. So it, don't worry if you have a seller who's out of state or a buyer who's out of state, we will certainly accommodate that and send a notary to them wherever they may be. And then also, you know, the uh, electronic notarization, it's, it's happening every day. We do them every day here. So if the county allows it and the customer is willing, um, they have access to a computer, at least a decent working tablet, we can certainly accommodate an e-signing as well. We have one coming up in Hawaii. Um, they're gonna e-sign soon. Tiffany so, Lake says that happy hour, <laughs> it's true for happy hour, especially to be on time. <laughs> yes, amen. Sierra, by the way, in a different life was a bartender. So she's crafting cocktails for us on Fridays. <laughs> Our closing coordinator. Um, yes, always be early for happy hour. And, and food and lunch and dinner and breakfast. Yeah, <laughs> I'll never be late for a meal if I can help it. Same. Um, so that's really it from us guys. I mean, I, I, I'll email this to Danielle um, you know, visit our website, play around with the net sheet. Let Beth know if you have any questions. She's always happy to, she's an expert on it. She can help you. Um, if you go on today and sign up for the website, <clears throat> there is a list of all the GM employees, I believe, but make sure you choose me. Mm -hmm. That way I can help you. When yeah. you have any questions, it will come right to my email. Yep. Can I jump in with just one question? This is Maria. Um, Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, nice good to see you, you again. again. Yes, um, I have um, two situations with uh, seller clients. Um, other, um, actually that other title company that everybody hates. Um, the one house closed on July 1st. The other house closed on August 19th. And both of my seller clients are waiting for their reimbursement of the final water bill and sewer bill. Like, I think like 200 or $300 was held in one case and like the bill was like, combined was like $40. And they um, sent the bill to the- Yes. So my seller- sent it to the title company? Yes, my seller clients have sent the bills to the title company and are still waiting for like payment to be made and reimbursement. Typically, how long is that supposed to take? 
because it seems like an extraordinary long time to me. It is. I'm sure it's probably just a case of them being completely inundated. Um, our post-closing coordinator, um, she typically takes care of those within five business days is our goal. Because of course, closings and disbursements come first. And then when you have a few minutes, you sneak those in, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so that's typically the first thing she does when she comes in the morning, in in the morning, as she looks at the previous day's final water and sewer bills that she receives and gets them paid or sends the reimbursement. I just feel like it's totally irresponsible to these title, this kind of company. Yeah. It does. I mean, mail takes a long time too. So if she's mailing, you know, if the checks have been cut and mailed, but it doesn't sound like the checks have been cut. So exactly. And then the other thing I had one where there was tax liens, the seller had tax liens. It was a terrible situation where she was, she was willing a month before closing to pay off the bill and they told her not to and to worry about it at closing. Well, then that turned into a total fiasco. And so money was held in escrow to pay off these tax liens. And so like when September, that was, that was August 19th when that closed. So when September 1st came around, another payment was due and was not paid. So now interest and penalties are being added on there because the title company did not make the payment and it still apparently has not made the payment. Like again, how long is something like that supposed to take? So like I was saying before, depending on the type of tax lien, it sounds like it was probably state of Ohio tax it lien. Was. Mm -hmm. um, it takes two weeks to get payoffs for those. So if let's say I ordered one today, I would have one in 10 business days. Yeah. Well, I would imagine they ordered that before the closing. They should have the payoffs in hand and any yeah. additional penalties or interest would be the responsibility of the title company if those funds have not been actually released to the state. Okay. Well, that's good to know because my seller's sweating this out thinking, okay, now they're, you know, they didn't make a no. payment. So now there's going to be interest and penalties on top of it. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, if we want to get really, really technical per RESPA, which is a federal guideline, federal law, we have three business days to disperse funds. We are not required to disperse any funds to you, to the seller, to anyone for three business days. We're allowed three business days. Of course, that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. We disperse funds the day we need to. Mm -hmm. um, so anything longer than three business days to pay off something that they should have already had a payoff for is, un I would say, unacceptable. Okay. Um, if they're holding money at closing, rather than paying it off at closing, it's because they probably didn't have a payoff in hand. Oh, believe me, my seller went through hoops and hurdles and gave them every documentation and even gave them access to her account to get in there. To, to, to mm, then there shouldn't be any reason they don't. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I mean, I just feel horrible. Any interest in penalties, uh, title insurance is now in effect. The deal has been closed. So any interest in penalties would not be of her or the buyer's obviously responsibility. Okay, that's good to know too, because you know she's obviously yeah, they could, not happy about it. They this. could file a claim because of that. Who could file a claim? She can. Mm -hmm. My seller. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Sure. Go ahead. And it goes back to the keys. So when does the buyer receive the keys? Not at the actual closing. You said the next day. Right, so because we're not in a round table area like Columbus or Cincinnati or Dayton where they all sit at a table and the realtors bring the keys, um, every keys are typically exchanged after you get notification from us that we have closed. Okay, what, so does the, is the realtor required to be at the signing? No, certainly not. And right now with COVID, we're, we're encouraging you not to be we know that a lot of realtors really do like to be at their closings. And if, and if you feel, especially if the customers really do need you there, of course, we'll make an exception, but just trying to keep everyone safe. We would prefer as few people at the closing right now as possible. Uh, but pre COVID, absolutely. You're welcome to go to all of your closings. Tiffany, can there I ask you the keys real quick on that for like realtors? Oh yes, please. 
Uh, so, Deborah, uh, what, what I always do is try to coordinate how keys are going to be exchanged beforehand, before it closes. Um, make sure the keys are at the house, garage door openers, all that fun stuff. Coordinate that mm -hmm. with the other agent. Okay. And then when we get the notification from the title company that it's transferred, or at least like quasi-transferred, um, that's filed, then, you know, I'll call the buyer, congratulate them, and then... Um, if you want to meet them at the house to give them the keys, if you just want to give them the lockbox code, that's kind of up to you, but kind of coordinate it beforehand. And then once it closes, that's when the exchange happens. Okay. Thank All you, right. Alex. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to see you. You too. I see Leslie too. Hi, Leslie. Good to see you. I, I only had it on single view for some reason, so I didn't even know all of you guys were here. I'm so excited. Um, you're going to, bye Maria. Yeah, I'm leaving. Thank you so much. Good to um, see you. I'm going to, before you leave, I just wanted to remind all of you that we are having a self-defense class today. It's um, free, no charge. It's, it's free from Thank two you. to four with refreshments and snacks after. Okay. And um, we- COVID we friendly as well. What? COVID safe. Yes, social distancing and we did fill up and send an email that all the spots were full, but then a couple of people have canceled. So we do have plenty of openings for today at two o'clock in Twinsburg at the Karate Institute. So if you guys would like to um, join us, you can go on the Facebook page and grab a ticket. Otherwise, we're having another one tomorrow at 10 a.m. in North Ridgeville, and it's right off the turnpike in North Ridgeville. So we hope to see you guys. Uh, let me give you guys my cell phone number, whoever wants I to did. write it down. I put it in the chat box. Oh, good. Okay. And then I'll email this to Danielle. You guys have an awesome day. All right, thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. If we wanted to kind of go deep in more detail, I can just email you guys and set up a time. To... Absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy to speak to anybody anytime. We can schedule another Zoom call or just a conference call, okay. you know, whatever, yeah. if you. I would love to meet with you. Uh, send me, um, what is your email address? Um, I can put it in the chat for you. Perfect. I'd love okay. to get together with you. And if you want to come to the office and meet some people and meet Tiffany, that'd be great. Yeah, anyone's welcome to come in the office, meet the closing team, meet myself. We're, we're readily available to you guys anytime. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Everybody take care. Bye-bye.